welcome everyone. Uh, so glad to have you here tonight. Uh, hope hope uh, everybody made it through the snowstorm today. But to get us started, I, I just want to really, really, I mean, this to me is such a very special uh, topic tonight. Uh, Jake is uh, as the Vice President of Public Affairs at Flint Hills Resources, Pine Bend Refinery, and he's been very involved in uh, the solar project that they're working on out there. And I'm so excited to have him uh, uh, be part of our presentation here tonight and uh, hopefully answer any questions that people have. Um, as you can see from the screen, it's, uh, it's that uh, beautiful site that's out uh, by Rosemont, Minnesota that looks like Disneyland at night. <laughs> so uh, with that, Jake, would you please go ahead? Yeah, Doug, thank you. I really appreciate uh, the invitation to speak uh, to your group tonight. Um, it really is a, a pleasure, and we're really excited to talk you know, specifically about our, our solar project uh, that uh, I'm sure some of you have heard about um, you know, from, from news reports. Uh, but what I'd like to do, if, and I'm happy to take questions as we, we go along here, um, if, if you have any, uh, and obviously happy to answer questions too at, at the end, but uh, provide a little bit of an overview of who we are, our, our business um, there in Rosemont, and then um, talk specifically about uh, our solar project and how that's going to you know, fit in and, and complement um, what we do. So I'll start with kind of a high level you know, introduction to uh, Flint Hills Resources. You know, we are uh, a subsidiary of, of Coke Industries. Uh, which is one of the larger you know, private companies um, in, in America with about 120,000 employees uh, worldwide. Um, we're, we're kind of almost like original Coke, if you will, um, uh, the foundation on which the, the company um, was, was largely built and, and has grown and it's very diversified um, now. And I'll, I'll give you a quick uh, overview of the, the current structure, but you know, Flint Hills has itself about 3000 employees and is based in, in Wichita, Kansas, which is where uh, Coke Industries is based as well. Um, here's just a snapshot of, of Coke today. Um, and, and this is maybe a little incomplete, but these are the primary companies with, uh, within Coke Industries, uh, Flint Hills being the, the refining um, part of the business, refineries and, and, and pipelines. And uh, again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Flint Hills here in a second, uh, but you can just see how diverse Coke is. Um, we have high-tech companies, software companies like uh, in, Infor, um, formerly uh, for, for folks here in Minnesota, uh, you might, uh, if you're in St. Paul or downtown St. Paul, you'll, you'll see the, the Infor building there as previously lost in software. Uh, so that's not part of, of Coke. Uh, Molex uh, technology company, um, like a lot of connectors and, and, and things of, of that nature that are in uh, Apple devices and other you know, computers and cars and many other things. Uh, Georgia Pacific is a pretty well-known uh, brand that's been part of Coke uh, for quite a number of years now. Um, and then, like I said, um, you know, some of the you know, parts of the business that are a little bit more industrial, like, like Flint House Resources, uh, Coke Fertilizer, Coke Energy Solutions. So very, very, very diverse uh, company at, at, at this point. Um, we, we also, in uh, Coke Industries more specifically, um, has a tremendous amount of investments in, in uh, you know, disruptive technologies, um, including um, in the areas of, of electrification. Um, these are just a, a few uh, few highlights of, of some of those uh, some of those investments. Um, so Flint Hills, and, and actually let me back up. Um, we also do now own a uh, solar company uh, based in Scottsdale, uh, Arizona. Um, and and uh, believe it or not, it was entirely a coincidence uh, that uh, Coke ultimately acquired uh, Depcom. Um, we were talking to them separately about our, our solar project and um, ended up you know, selecting them as our EPC and only subsequently uh, found out um, Coke was looking at uh, possibly acquiring them. So it, it just uh, was truly a, a coincidence. So again, kind of the diversity of, of Coke these days. Um, so for Flint Hills, just to give you a little bit of a, a sense for our geographic you know, footprint, uh, we are a primarily a, a U.S. Um, company with uh, operations for the most part in the upper Midwest and, and then in Texas. We do have some holdings in, in Canada as well. Um, 
a little bit closer look at uh, these, these are physical assets. And these are refineries, terminals, pipelines uh, that um, we own and, and operate. Um, and, and again, I'll give you a little bit more perspective on that here. Uh, these are, uh, we have three refineries, uh, two in South Texas and in Corpus Christi, and then um, the Minnesota refinery. Uh, the, we have a combined refining capacity of about 700,000 barrels a day, uh, and then also about 3 billion pounds or so of, of you know, various petrochemicals. So the refinery in Minnesota, um, it, very interesting place. Um, uh, I think Doug, you mentioned it, it looks like Disney uh, World at, at night and it, it is uh, quite quite a spectacle at night if you're, if you're driving by or if you've ever driven by, it's hard, hard to miss. Um, but it is one of the, the nation's largest, most complex and you know, efficient refineries. Um, it was established in, in the mid fifties uh, has, has grown uh, a great deal. It, it was established originally at, a, at about uh, 25,000 um, barrels a day, and, and uh, it's obviously much, much larger than now. Um, some of the products that we, we make, um, most of which are obvious, perhaps, like gasoline and diesel fuel and, and, and jet fuel, uh, perhaps less obvious, uh, ammonium thiosulfate fertilizer. Uh, we're one of the largest producers of, of, of ATS for short. Uh, we actually um, are, are using um, what has traditionally been uh, a pollutant or, or a waste material, uh, sulfur, and converting that to a, a very stable form of liquid fertilizer. So taking what traditionally was pollution and converting it to a, a value, valued and needed product that benefits farmers. Uh, it's, it's really been a kind of a neat innovation. Um, over the years, uh, the soft, uh, soil has become somewhat sulfur deficient um, in large part because um, air, the air has been you know, so much cleaner in, in recent decades, um, you know, thanks to a lot of efforts to, to reduce emissions. Um, so uh, this technology really allows us to take uh, that traditional source of pollu pollution that would uh, you know, form acid rain and come to the you know, ground and, and uh, provide some free, I guess, fertilizer. That's no longer happening, which, which is good, uh, but this is a, a way to, to help address the, the need for uh, that element uh, without, uh, of course, uh, creating pollution. So kind of a neat innovation that, that we've advanced in the last few years here. Uh, we also, sulfur is also used in a lot of other uh, applications uh, as, as well, uh, everything from you know, pharmaceuticals to, to cosmetics. Uh, propane, butane, these are um, products too that uh, are, are perhaps uh, less known, less understood. Um, propane isn't, it, you know, the primary use of propane, uh, I, I know for most of us might be grilling out uh, during the summer, uh, but you know, candidly, there's not a lot of demand for, for propane. It's primarily used for uh, home heating still. Um, the agriculture industry uses it a lot uh, for drying crops and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, the biggest use, however, is uh, in petrochemicals where it's uh, used to you know, make uh, you know, propylene um, largely. So various things that uh, have propylene in it, you know, plastics, containers, you know, a lot of automotive components and, and many, many other things. Um, so that's that's kind of uh, our, our main uh, portfolio of of products um, with gasoline and, and diesel and of course jet fuel being the the, the major uh, ones. A little history uh, on this refinery, as I, I mentioned, it was established in the mid fifties uh, at about twenty five thousand barrels a day. Um, back then, there were a lot of small refineries all over the country. I, I believe Minnesota even had maybe three or four small refineries. Um, you know, this one uh, has, has certainly evolved over, over time. Um, Coke ultimately acquired its interest in, in the company uh, pretty early on and, and then uh, outright ownership of it um, in the 70s. Uh, in 2002, uh, the, the uh, refinery's name changed from uh, Coke Refinery or Coke Petroleum, I believe it was at the time, uh, to Flint Hills Resources. Uh, that was around the same time uh, Coke was uh, making other acquisitions like Georgia Pacific and Avista, and, and so they, they set up um, you know, independently managed subsidiaries of Coke uh, with their own kind of names and, and brands. And so uh, Flint Hills Resources has been the name since 2002. Uh, of course, a lot of people still refer to us as, as the Coke refinery, uh, which, which is fine, but uh, technically we are Flint Hills Resources and a subsidiary of Coke. So the refinery itself is, is a pretty important asset. Um, 
for, for, for Minnesota uh, and really the, the region. Uh, today, uh, it's at over 370,000 barrels a day of, of refining capacity. Um, you know, that's top you know, 12, top 15 in the country, I, I believe, uh, for total refining capacity. About the second largest facility uh, in, in the Midwest, uh, there's a refinery in, um, in Indiana, uh, just across the border from Chicago, that uh, British Petroleum operates that's uh, larger than, than Pine Bend. Uh, but, but this is a pretty, pretty large facility. The larger refineries in the world are in the Gulf Coast. Um, so uh, outside of the Gulf Coast, this is, again, one of the largest refineries in, uh, in, in the country. Um, we also you know, acquire a lot of ethanol that we blend in, in motor fuel, um, the largest uh, purchaser of ethanol, uh, certainly in, in, in the region. Um, and we're actually one of the largest uh, producers of asphalt in the entire country. We, we do sell asphalt um, coast to coast. And, um, you know, approximately um, you know, 10% or so of uh, total um, U.S. asphalt supply. Um, so a pretty significant a chunk of overall national demand for, for asphalt is satisfied by, uh, by our facility uh, here in Rosemont. It's over you know, 5,000 uh, tons of, of asphalt production um, a day. So some fun facts, just again, for perspective, perhaps on, on uh, what we do. Um, if you were to take our full refining capacity of 375,000 barrels a day and converted that to all the liquid fuels, which uh, I'm no engineer, but they tell me we can't do that. But you know, directionally, that is our overall you know, production make. That's the equivalent of you know, one of those 9,000 uh, gallon tanker trucks a minute. Uh, and that's year round, 24-7. You know, um, so it's it's pretty pretty staggering when you think about the volumes um, and, and really the the need you know still for, for these types of, of fuels. Um, our refinery in, uh, at Rosemont there um, we have terminals that you know this is where the trucks come and pick up the product before they you know when they bring it to the, the retail level. Um, we have terminals all over the region. Uh, and one at the at the rack we call it at, at Pine Bend that sees about 160 trucks a day. Uh, but the vast majority of our product leaves the refinery by pipeline. Um, so we have um, quite a bit of pipeline, as you might imagine, that allows us to supply the uh, really the, the entire region. Um, you know, we're responsible for, uh, you know, the vast majority of uh, Minnesota's you know, transportation fuel. Um, we're responsible for just about half of Wisconsin. Uh, it's total you know, demand as well as a good chunk of the Dakotas and, uh, and Iowa as well. Um, we move physical product, uh, as, you know, really as far south, south as Texas at, at times, like we're you know, actually able to meet demand that far south. Um, you know, we provide jet fuel um, all over uh, the, the country as well, uh, but we're uh, really the main supplier in, in, in Minnesota of, uh, of all jet fuel. Uh, the refinery itself, you know, occupies about a thousand acres of, of property um, total. We have uh, over five thousand uh, in, in our holdings. Uh, much of that is what we refer to as buffer property or a property that we've acquired over over time, just to create a little bit of a distance between us and, and, and some of our um, you know neighbors. We're a really safe refinery. We've done a really good job at, at cutting emissions, uh, but it's still, you know, good uh, to, to have a little space between you and your and your closest neighbors. Obviously, refining, uh, you know, can be uh, and is inherently, you know, dangerous. Right? You're you're dealing with combustible materials under extreme pressures and temperatures. Um, so safety is always the most important thing. You know, we do. Uh, every day and and, um, and and having some buffer property and, and everything else we do to make sure we're, we're responsible uh, is is helpful uh, to, to sh you know for sure uh, but it also has created an opportunity for us that we'll be talking about here in a second with respect to our solar investments um, as I mentioned the product that leaves our facility mostly comes out by by pipeline we have over 500 miles of, of pipeline um, and fuel terminals and, of course, asphalt terminals uh, all over the region. So, again, that's the stop before it gets to the retail level. Uh, uh, and from a retail perspective, um, we don't own uh, retail stores, uh, gas stations, uh, but we have primary customers. And in, the, in this region, those customers uh, are Quick Trip, uh, you know, PCs, Holiday Station stores. Uh, chances are, if you're at any of those um, 
um, places, you are, um, you know, buying our fuel. That's, that's pretty much uh, uh, the breakdown real, really in, in Minnesota. And a lot of the independents as well uh, get, get product from us too. Uh, real quick, 101 on the refining side, and again, I, I know we're here to talk about solar, but this, I think, gives some perspective on, you know, the energy intensity of our operations and what we do and then how solar will, will fit in. So I hope I'm not boring you with uh, too much refinery talk here, but um, this is a real simple equation on crude oil, um, and the oil that we primarily refine it tends to be a heavier crude oil which has about 40% or so naturally occurring asphalt in it. And so you can see there in the graphic uh, where demand is. So the products that you know, the marketplace needs are primarily you know, these lighter products like gasoline, you know, jet fuel, and, and diesel fuel. Uh, diesel, by the way, has been um, much higher in demand uh, over the last several years, including during, during the COVID uh, years. Because uh, as you might imagine, supply chains were still you know, moving and needed uh, needed fuel to, to move. And so while gasoline definitely declined significantly, uh, and diesel picked up. Uh, diesel is also a similar molecule uh, to jet fuel. And so those two areas tend to either complement or compete a little bit with each other uh, based on, on demand. Uh, gasoline demand you know, stays relatively you know, flat. Uh, it's uh, going down a little bit in, in recent years. Obviously, with electrification, um, you know, biofuels, and other things like that, um, you, you know, better fuel economy. Uh, but you also do see, um, you know, more more use. Um, you know, more people are are driving more and flying more uh, now. Uh, so demand has uh, certainly um, you know picked up, um, especially post uh, post COVID. Uh, but our refinery really is set up to optimally take a heavy you know, crude oil barrel and convert it, you know, really perfectly to demand, you know, what, what's actually needed. So taking the, the, you know, some of the lower valued items and putting them in the higher valued uh, demand area is, is what we, we really specialize in. So we uh, get crude oil. Uh, this is how our crude oil uh, comes to us, by the way. Uh, I'm sure most of you know, there's no natural occurring crude oil in the state of Minnesota. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a Wikipedia fact, uh, but I believe, according to, again, to Wikipedia, we're the largest refinery in a non-oil producing state in the country. Um, so there you go. But uh, again, that's according to Wikipedia. But um, the, we are supplied um, primarily by pipelines that come across uh, the northern uh, part of our country and, and southern Canada. Uh, there's six or seven pipelines that come through that portion of, uh, of our state. And then we pick it up on our pipeline system, uh, which is uh, illustrated here on, on this map. It's called the Minnesota Pipeline System. It consists of four pipelines that originate in Clearbrook, Minnesota. The original uh, legacy system, uh, M we call them MPL um, one, two, and three, you can see in, uh, I think that's kind of a purple color, uh, but that comes in through the north and then kind of loops around you know, to the east of the Twin Cities area before uh, coming to uh, our refinery and also the St. Paul Park refinery. There's only two refineries in Minnesota, uh, the Flint Hills uh, Pine Bend refinery, uh, again, 375,000 barrels a day of refined capacity. And then uh, St. Paul Park, uh, which is owned by uh, Marathon, um, that's a smaller facility at about 100,000 barrels a day or, or so. Um, so this system supplies both of those refineries. Uh, the red line is uh, the newest segment of the MPL system, which is MPL4. Uh, some of you may remember the MinCan project. That's what that was uh, you know, back maybe, gosh, 15 years ago now or so. Um, so that, that pipeline um, loops around to the west and comes in uh, really from, from the south. And, and the reason for the new right of way was when it came time to build that project, you know, the Twin Cities area had, had grown so much and it was not a lot of room, uh, you know, there to the east. So uh, we established a, a new right of way. Um, that pipeline was recently, um, uh, we added new uh, pump stations to it to increase the through put capacity, which uh, is providing greater reliability on the system overall and allowing us to take uh, product or barrels 
off of the legacy system and put them on a new system so we can do more preventative maintenance work since that um, original system uh, is, is certainly older and as pipelines age, you have to just do a lot more maintenance. So uh, that, that red line is really important now because um, you know without it, we, we'd you know, potentially be disrupting you know supplies to uh, Minnesota's refineries. And you, you know you can imagine uh, without this pipeline system, um, you know, we, we would have a hard time uh, you know supplying this region uh, with uh, with the fuels that we all still very much depend on. Um, real quick perspective on crude oil and how it moves around the country and the refineries that uh, need it and use it. Uh, this is what that map captures. Um, you can see again that main pipeline system that uh, comes across uh, the northern part of our state uh, from, from Canada. Um, you know, we're, we're geographically blessed in, in Minnesota. I, I know it doesn't feel that way sometimes, especially on the cold January snowy days. Uh, but we are fortunate to be located um, you know, near um, regions that have uh, abundant crude supplies, um, like in Canada and the Dakotas, North Dakota specifically, uh, that, that really does help a lot with our energy reliability. Uh, we also have really robust you know, pipelines that um, can very efficiently deliver uh, that crude oil to refineries. And then, of course, we, we believe we have great refineries, especially our refinery that does such a good job of, of um, producing the fuels we need in, in a responsible manner. Um, so that's how that product kind of moves around. And here's just a quick look at the refined product pipelines. Um, so previous slide was crude oil, this is refined product. Uh, so you can again see how uh, you know connected the, the country is uh, with the exception of California. California is kind of on its own, uh, but the rest of the country, uh, fuel really moves around. Um, it's a commodity that, that really responds you know, to price signals. Um, that's the only way this industry actually can work. Um, it's against the law for us to, you know, pick up the phone and call our competitors and say, hey, you know, what are you doing today? Are you, what's going on with your facility? Um, you know, antitrust really prohibits us from that type of communication. So uh, products move based on price signals. Um, and, and that's kind of how this uh, system works. A little economic perspective. So our facility employs about 1,000 people full time. Um, indirectly, uh, it's between 3,500 and you know, upwards of 7,000 full time job equivalents are, are tied to our facility. Um, so pretty significant um, employer uh, in, in the state and, and of course in, in Dakota County where we're based. Uh, we're also a good chunk of the local uh, tax base as well, uh, with about 12% um, total assessment there for Rosemont. Uh, and actually, our facility spans two cities. We're in Invergrove Heights and Rosemont. Uh, most of the production assets are in, in Rosemont. Um, so we, we have the benefit of uh, being spread out there uh, with between the two, uh, two cities there in the South Metro. Um, we, we call ourselves uh, the most active construction site in Minnesota or, or the largest construction site in Minnesota. Uh, we, you know, typically will um, average, well, honestly, hundreds of uh, contractors on site. So these are skilled labor uh, roles, uh, you know, carpenters, electricians, plumbers, pipe fitters, uh, steam fitters, um, the list goes on and on. Um, so really large uh, site. Um, we uh, you know, typically have about $200 million just in maintenance uh, every, every single year we do. Um, so that's why, again, we're, we're such a large contractor, a site, the, the largest one in, in the state. Uh, additional perspective on that, you know, we've really built the equivalent of two Viking stadiums in the last, um, in the last 10 years. Um, our daily construction workforce um, is, is uh, you know, typically in the hundreds. Uh, we've had years where we've averaged over, um, yeah, I think it's 2,000 contractors one year we averaged uh, during the course of the year. And for perspective, during peak construction of the Viking Stadium, uh, they saw 900 people working at once. Um, so that's you know, almost a slow day for, for us. Um, so again, just perspective on what it takes to, uh, to operate a facility uh, like a refinery, uh, especially a large one. Uh, some recent projects that uh, you may have heard about, there's been certainly some news coverage on, on these over the years. These are really every project we've done, I think in the last 15, 20 years have been beneficial in, in many ways. You know, obviously making products that people still need, but making them even better. Um, in other words, finding ways to reduce emissions while increasing uh, our production. Um, and so that's what we've really, really been great at doing the last um, 10, 15 years. Uh, and the solar project is very consistent with, um, with those types of investments that we've, uh, we've been making. They help make us more competitive. They help us produce more products that people need and they help us lower emissions. Uh, so that's really been 
kind of our um, focus here over the last uh, several years. And again, these are just some of the projects that we've, uh, we've done uh, that are perhaps most notable. Uh, from a safety and perspective of all those workers, uh, of course, you know, safety is by far the most important thing that we emphasize every single day. Uh, we are a certified MinStar site. We're the first ever Pro 10 certified work site, uh, which is a uh, special uh, program specifically for contractors. Um, so really important, something that has expanded across the country, actually, but started at, uh, at Unbanned. Uh, we've reduced injuries by more than 70% in the last 15 years. Um, which is great, but it also tells you 15 years ago, maybe you weren't doing such a good job, right? Um, and that's similar on the environmental side as well. Uh, but we do uh, and have done a good job, but you're only as good as your last good day. And so you, you really have to stay vigilant when it comes to safety. Um, a lot of people are surprised to know we have our own fire department. In fact, uh, two uh, firehouses uh, and a full-time fire department and a lot of volunteers as well that are employees who, uh, who support that. Uh, a lot of refineries just rely on uh, local services um, if they need them. And, and again, refineries can be dangerous. You're dealing with uh, combustible materials and there, there are occasionally um, you know, serious incidents. And um, you know, by having our own fire department, we're able to uh, respond very promptly to, to any potential risks. Fortunately, they, they spend most of their time training and that's what you want, uh, not, not responding. Uh, but they are there uh, if, if we ever need them. Uh, but but again, these larger events are pretty rare. Uh, but it's an added level of insurance. It's an added level of uh, of, of you know capability to make sure uh, we're keeping our folks and, and our communities safe. Um, our fire department also uh, is involved in mutual aid and in, in the surrounding community and um, is, is very active. Uh, our facility also, I believe, is the only live fire training grounds in, in the metropolitan area. So we get a lot of um, uh, fire departments from Minneapolis, St. Paul, really the entire you know, area that come to our facility for training. So if you're ever driving in Rosemont and Rich Valley Boulevard and you see a little um, fire or, or a little bit of smoke, um, that's probably what that is. It's our training ground. It's it's not an actual hazard, uh, but it, it's important for fire departments, uh, obviously, to, to be able to, to be trained and understand how to put out actual fires. It's not something you can, can really simulate, um, so it's an important area and, and uh, one of the ways we, we try to get back to the community. Um, refineries, as you might imagine, too, have so much uh, environmental controls, and um, we have a, a, a tremendous amount of monitors on our stacks, on our fence lines, on our tanks. Um, we have community air monitors around the facility. Um, you'll, you'll be pleased to know that the air quality around our facility is as good as uh, air quality and, and really anywhere else in Minnesota. Um, you know, we've done a good job over the past you know, 15 years or so uh, at, at reducing emissions. Um, you know, it used to be a place, um, you know, you could, you could smell us probably before you could see us, um, you know, in, in the 90s, uh, and that's no longer, no longer the case. Uh, really, there shouldn't be any detectable odor around our facility anymore. Um, obviously, we have some neighbors, too, that are uh, in, in manufacturing space, so sometimes uh, uh, they have a little odor associated with their uh, operations. Uh, but with us, I mean, again, you, you can have issues that occasionally there, there could be some odor, but it's, it should be the exception, uh, not, not, not the norm, um, that's for sure. Um, a lot of cool innovations too, and just another one to highlight, uh, we're partnering with one of our sister companies, Molex, uh, to deploy um, these advanced uh, uh, leak detection sensor networks. Um, there are these little sensors that are scattered throughout the entire refinery that can detect the most minute leak, you know, leaks that would likely not get detected for uh, weeks, days, months, or maybe ever. Um, and, and we're able to use weather data as well to triangulate and understand exactly where these small minor leaks are occurring. So really neat innovations that are taking place uh, in our industry, including ones that we're just leading ourselves. Um, so we're, we're really excited about the future and, and how we continue to find ways to produce the products that, that people need um, in an even better, more efficient, more responsible you know, manner. Uh, we even have weather data that helps us 
adjust the refinery, you know, based on you know, changing uh, barometric pressure. And uh, if a rainstorm is going to come, it affects our steam balance in the refinery significantly. So being faster to be able to respond to that, um, you, you, you're so much more efficient. You save more energy. Uh, it's better environmentally speaking. It's, it's better economically. Um, so a lot of things like that we're doing that just make us so much better. Uh, than uh, than we have been in, in, in the past um, as an individual refinery and and certainly as an industry overall and again solar really fits that too. Um, so I'm going to talk just quick here then about um, our, our kind of we call it stewardship. Um, you know, it's similar to I guess sustainability for a lot of people. Uh, we think you know stewardship is for us anyway uh, the best way to approach um, kind of our environmental responsibilities. Um, you know ESG. Um, is, is kind of how we, we think about it. In fact, just today, you're the first uh, people to know this externally. Uh, we launched our, um, our first uh, official stewardship report. Um, and this is uh, on our website um, as we speak. We've, we've not announced it publicly. We just shared it with our employees um, today. And so, you know, this report um, and you know, our stewardship efforts are, are really focused on, on four you know, key areas. Um, you know, the first of which, of course, for us is always going to be safety, uh, environmental stewardship is, is there, uh, people and communities, and then uh, innovation. So those are kind of our pillars of, of, of stewardship and how we're approaching, uh, you know, our efforts to continuously approve. Uh, this, of course, isn't new. We've been doing this for a lot of years. Uh, obviously, there's much more need and interest and, and, and desire to, to, to see transparent uh, results uh, when it comes to our industry and our performance. So, you know, this is an effort um, to meet those those you know, needs and, and the requests that we receive uh, about you know, how we operate and, and uh, you know, confirming that we're doing the right things and, and being responsible. So that report's now available and it's got metrics on, you know, everything from our um, you know, traditional criteria pollutants, uh, greenhouse gases, you know, water um, use and impacts. Um, and it's something we'll continue to, to maintain and, and update and adjust based on uh, you know needs people have or, uh, regarding our operations. So uh, hot off the presses. Real quick highlights so of this facility and uh, some of our environmental efforts. Um, we are you know one of the cleaner refineries now in the country, which, which is great uh, to be able to say that. Um, you know we've reduced our traditional uh, pollutants that's like NOx and SOx by about seventy percent since two thousand while increasing production to, to meet demand. Um, so that's been, again, kind of our key effort over the last uh, several years. Um, we've reduced our greenhouse gases, not our total greenhouse gases, mind you, but our greenhouse gas intensity. So um, from a production standpoint, uh, we've been able to reduce on a per barrel basis our greenhouse gases by about 15%. You know, percent. Um, our overall air emissions are about 20% lower than the industry average. So you take the average refinery, we're about 20% better than, than that refinery. Again, these are good numbers and, and uh, we're proud of them, but it also tells you, you know, in the 90s, um, you know, and we weren't alone here, a lot of refineries, um, you know, had quite significant emissions and, and the industry overhaul has gotten a lot better at reducing them. Uh, and we started our really aggressive effort to reduce emissions um, as part of a, what we call the 50 and 5 effort, and it was uh, an effort to reduce emissions by 50% in five years. And we did this in partnership uh, with the Minnesota Center for Environmental um, Advocacy. Um, and, um, you know, that was a very successful effort. And then we just kept going, you know, we kept, kept working it and we continue it to, you know, to this day, um, what we call, you know, continuous improvement across all categories. That's, that's really our focus. Here again, just this is detail on what I just outlined in terms of those uh, emission reductions over the last, uh, well, really since the 90s. Uh, you can see here making continu continual progress uh, year over year. Uh, this, this is a, a chart that just shows our flaring. Flaring is really a safety mechanism, but if you see a flare or you know any flame uh, out of a refinery or you know, some other production facilities that have you know, these type of gases uh, have flares, um, in, in you know parts of I don't like to point fingers at others, but in parts of the country, other refiners that I won't name, um, sometimes have almost a constant flare going. Um, we don't do that, and again, it's really uh, how you run your facility, but but also it's it's there for for safety. Uh, if if you have an issue or a unit gets you know tripped because it loses electrical power or you know something happens, you need to bring that to a safe state and. 
all the material that's in process needs to go somewhere. Otherwise, uh, you can have a very serious incident. So you have to really um, get rid of it uh, from process. And um, and the best way to do that, first of all, is to, to avoid having to do it, which we work hard at. Uh, we, we do have what's called flare gas recovery technology. So we could pull a lot of that product back in, but invariably there is still some material in system, especially if it's a real sudden shutdown. Uh, that from a safety perspective has to go to the flare. And so you're really just burning off uh, the material that's in process in order to bring that um, unit to a safe state. So that's what flaring is. And we're really good at not doing that. So, um, you know, honestly too, we've had, you know, we've had, uh, uh, this is before I came to, to the company, but there was a time when we were actually, I believe in the flight simulator at Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport where pilots, you know, could uh, probably count on our flare being on in order to help find the airport. Um, that's no longer the case. Um, so we, we, we flare very, very infrequently. Uh, water is a big part of our business too, as you might imagine, you know, on a cold day like today, if you drive by, you're going to see a lot of steam uh, coming off of our facility. You know, in the middle of summer, uh, you won't see really anything. Um, you know, obviously some people uh, look at that and maybe think it's pollution, but, but truly it's, it's steam, it's you know, water vapor. Um, so we, we do kick off quite a bit of, of steam. We have se several cooling towers, but we've made a lot of investments in those cooling towers that have helped us reduce our water consumption. Um, so much of the water that we use in process is for heating and cooling uh, does you know, go to atmosphere in the form of, of steam. Um, some of it um, ultimately gets processed and, uh, and, or if it comes into contact with any of the process, um, it, it obviously has to be um, you know, cleaned and, and maintained before ultimately getting discharged in, into, into the river. So we're, uh, we, we have a really solid track record. Um, you know, of course, working with the Pollution Control Agency on making sure our fluent is, uh, is uh, always meeting you know, the standards. Uh, so we've done a, a good job with that. We also work really hard to minimize our water use. We, we do pull water uh, directly from, uh, from the aquifer. That's our main you know, supply. Uh, but we have water recovery, water reuse. Uh, it's really allowed us to cut down significantly on our overall water consumption. In fact, uh, the last time we technically expanded the refinery was in the, um, in, in the 90, late 90s, early 2000s. And um, our community and our we have a community advisory council, they were a little reluctant to have us drill another well to, to increase our water appropriation. So instead of doing that, we um, invested in some technologies of you know, reverse osmosis system, water reuse systems uh, that uh, have allowed us to, to meet our um, needs without really expanding our, our, our appropriations. So we've kind of lived within that you know, since then, but we're continuing to work to find ways to minimize our, our water use. All right, solar, what we're all here for, right? Um, so we're, we're super excited about this project. Um, you know, we believe, and, and uh, you guys perhaps can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but this will be one of the largest uh, direct use of solar power in the entire country. So behind the meter, uh, directly supplying our facility. Uh, so we're super excited about that and just how it kind of fits into our overall, you know, if you will, energy portfolio. Um, you can see we're an energy star site, you know, three years in a row. That means we're in the top uh, quartile of all refineries in the nation for energy efficiency. Um, you've done a real, real good job with that of minimizing our energy consumption, but we still require a lot of energy. And so, um, you know, solar and previously our combined heat and power we constructed, I guess, about five years ago now has, has really helped us um, uh, be more economic with, with our solar, with our electric energy and meet some of our needs while also um, you know, reducing emissions, which of course is, is really the, the name of the game. Um, so this refinery or this solar project would be about 45 megawatts, or not about is 45 megawatts. Um, that's about 120 actually, a thousand uh, solar panels. It's gonna be located on our property, um, just uh, west of the refinery. So if you're on highway 55, uh, the refinery is immediately, if you're going south, is, is to the west, so on the other side of, uh, of the refinery. Um, portions of it will be um, on um, the same side the refinery actually is on, uh, on the west, uh, the other side of Rich Valley Boulevard, but much of the rest of it will be uh, across Rich Valley Boulevard on uh, agricultural land that we've owned for um, you know decades. 
So we'll be converting um, for the most part um, ag land to, uh, to, to occupy this 300 acre uh, solar uh, garden. So together with our CHP, which as I said, we built about five years ago, about 70% of the refineries overall electrical power needs will be self-generated, um, which, which is really cool. It's super efficient. Our CHP, um, by the way, is one of the most efficient uh, around. Um, again, we make a lot of steam. And so we can take some of that steam, especially during certain times of the year, like winter when we have extra and use it to um, make electricity. And so a uh, really, really efficient system. Um, obviously, too, that reduces Minnesota's overall needs as well when we're able to kind of satisfy some of our own. And by locating you know, the CHP and also solar uh, you know, at our facility, uh, close to our facility, uh, you know, you're, you're more efficient with respect to the line loss. Um, it, it overall just really fits, um, you know, a, a need to for that power to get where it needs to go much more efficiently, which reduces, um, you know, costs, but it also uh, is beneficial from an environmental you know, perspective. Uh, locating generation, you know, closer to where the power consumption is, is inherently better, at least at our scale, for sure. Um, and speaking of our scale, um, you know, we are, uh, our, our load factor is about 130 megawatts. So we're uh, traditionally Excel's largest customer. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that's still going to be the case after solar is done, but, but it may still very well be. Um, so we'll still be a pretty large so, uh, customer, but, uh, but definitely a little bit smaller uh, since we'll be self-generating more of our own power. Uh, here's just a kind of a before an artist rendering of the after um, of, of uh, this property and what it's going to look like uh, here uh, next year is, is our hope. Um, and uh, here's a better uh, overhead, I guess, of, of what is in front of us and uh, the properties that will be uh, occupied um, by the, the solar panels. Um, you can see the refinery there is actually right to the right of the purple uh, shaded areas, which is again where the solar is going to go. Um, 45 megawatts, as I said, you know, uh, about 350 acres, it'll be fenced in, um, about a you know, mile of power uh, connections, a few feeders, um, and again, all the power will be directly consumed by, uh, by our refinery, so it's behind the meter in, in that respect. So that's kind of what it looks like, and again, the, the location um, there, the photo there in the, in the bottom is perhaps a, a representation of its proximity uh, to the refinery itself. Um, this is uh, this is today. Uh, these photos actually, uh, you can see the, the work in progress. Uh, not a lot of fun things to look at yet. Um, we're still staging. We're doing some grading work. Uh, got a good chunk of the grading work done. Um, there's still a few things left. Um, we're still working through some challenges on on um, on, on grading and, um, and and kind of surface water management um, you know, challenges. Um, you know, just in terms of uh, making sure, um, you know, meeting city requirements, but, but also, um, you know, projects like this haven't been done in, you know, in, in Rosemont. So, you know, it's kind of a learning opportunity for, for a lot of us and for the city as well to, to figure out how to uh, exactly permit uh, a project like this. And it's due to us too. Um, so we're, we're all learning. Um, we're also really, you know, excited because again, this is the largest I think application, direct application of solar in the country uh, into a you know industrial facility with a large load factor that you know runs 24/7. Um, so we're excited to share knowledge, uh, what we learn. Uh, obviously, demonstrate uh, that uh, solar can can work really well um, in in uh, supplying a facility like ours that runs continuously and importantly needs uninterrupted power. Because uh, if we have uh, any issues, electrical issues. That's a bad day. That's when you 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 know have to shut down units, and that's when you have you know the flares go on, and you can have environmental issues and challenges. So, electric power reliability is super super important, and uh, we're confident that this project will um, allow us to continue to have very reliable power. Of course, Excel Energy will, will still be supplying um, you know power to the refinery and also backup power when uh, we when we need it. Um, so that's really important. Excel's done a fantastic job over the years, um, improving energy reliability around our facility, uh, which has helped a, a great deal. So, uh, you know, these again are kind of the highlights of, of this project at 45 megawatts, um, um, you know, all behind the meter. Uh, we are going to be doing, you know, poll pollinator friendly uh, habitat. 
Um, when you combine everything again with CHP, it's over 70% of our overall need demand for, for, for electrical power, uh, about as efficient as, as it gets, uh, which, which is super, super exciting. The pollinator piece of it, um, we're, we're excited about too. Uh, and, th and this too is just hot off the presses because uh, for decades now, we've been doing a lot of habitat work around the state, but, but it's also specifically at what we refer to as the Pine Bend Bluffs. Uh, which is property along the Mississippi River that we've owned um, and we've been working to restore over the last uh, 25 years, uh, working with Friends of the Mississippi River, Great River Greening. It's just a, a beautiful um, and very e ecologically uh, you know, important uh, part of uh, our state. Uh, so it's been a great collaboration. Um, we just found out, uh, again, this hasn't been made public yet, but we'll be announcing it here shortly, that uh, we, we've uh, earned gold certification status from the National Wildlife Habitat Council. Um, so that's that's a big deal. I, I think there's maybe one other site in all of Minnesota that has gold uh, standing. Um, so it, it's a significant accomplishment, something we're, we're super excited about. But we're going to be applying the same you know, approach to um, the solar portion of our property. So kind of opening up a new front, if you will, for, for our habitat restoration efforts. So with, with that, and, and this is just a quick highlight of all these various partners we have in the community um, that we work with, and including many of them on, on this project. I uh, mentioned, you know, Friends of the Mississippi River and Great River Greening, but they're, uh, they're really, uh, you know, a part of our effort here is always to, you know, be responsible, to always be safe. Um, it's part of our stewardship, you know, imperative that we also you know, work with our communities and, and be a, you know, good corporate citizen. So um, I think the solar project is certainly consistent with that, but also, you know, economically, um, it makes sense. I mean, we'd, we would not be doing this project if it didn't have a, a good, a solid foundation economically. Um, and, um, you know, this, this really does fit in. It makes us more competitive. Uh, our electric energy rates are uh, less competitive uh, than our, uh, the, the rates that our competition enjoys in other parts of the country. And so this project will help um, make it more uh, competitive in that respect. And then obviously it reduces emissions associated with producing the products that we make and, and that people you know, need and, and use every day. So that's that's kind of my prepared remarks here. I'm happy to answer questions if you if you have any. Jake, do you think this? Uh this will be the extent of solar, or do you think there is a possibility that eventually more will be added? Certainly possible. Um, you know, we have a lot of property. Um, you know, while this is gonna occupy about 350 acres, um, you know, we have just on that backside of the refinery, probably a couple thousand acres. Um, and and uh, we have no plans to develop or, or do really anything with that property at, at this time. So certainly potentially um, we, we could you know possibly add more. Right now we, we think this uh, fits really well with you know our our existing uh, infrastructure. Um, adding more would also require more investments in, in, in maybe transmission and, and some of the other things in the refinery itself. Uh, that would make it maybe a little less economically uh, advantageous. Um, so this is the right size for us right now. Um, but um, you know we're we're constantly exploring you know ways to you know get better at everything that that we do. And and so if if there's something uh, that makes sense from a renewable standpoint, whether it's um, you know solar or some other um, you know way to you know improve our our uh, our energy use uh, material that we use, uh, you know, all that stuff's on the, on the table. We're, we're constantly looking, we're constantly exploring, but uh, yeah, it's certainly possible that uh, additional solar could be added in the future. Are there, are there any other privately owned uh, companies in Minnesota or nationwide that are doing anything similar to this? You know, it's, yeah, what's fun about this is uh, so Devcom again coincidentally became um, a sister company during during this process, or actually just before this or after the process started. Uh, but they um, they and and um, we've heard from others um, 
didn't really fully appreciate the opportunity uh, there is for behind the meter solar developments. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of focus on you know more of the utility uh, approach and working with electric utilities and you, electric utilities themselves investing in, in solar and of course community solar. Um, you know, people haven't put a lot of effort yet. I, I don't think behind uh, marketing solar to um, businesses directly. Of course, the rooftop things and we all we all know all about those. But in terms of you know heavy industrial sites, uh, sites that you know require a great deal of electrical energy. Um, this this is really you know kind of untapped. Now it's going to vary in terms of value and, and markets based on you know the economics of, of those regions. Um, you know we have a refinery in South Texas as, as we talked about. Uh, we are looking at you know adding solar there. It's a different um, from a economic standpoint. Um, you know benefit. Um, it's not as strong as it is here because the electric energy rates are more competitive in, in, in Texas than they are in Minnesota, and. When I, when I say competitive, the rate structure in, in, in Minnesota is about, for large industrials, is about, actually, I think it's like 15% or so disadvantaged uh, compared to like the Gulf Coast. So we're, 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 we're spending a lot more on our electricity than our competition is. Uh, so large industrials in, in the state really kind of subsidize other rate bases, um, you know, retail and, and residential. Uh, and we, we just pay more and, and that's just kind of how it's been in, in, in the state. So that is creating more of an incentive, you know, for self-generation like our CHP and obviously now, now solar. It's not, you know, cheap and it's a pretty expensive, you know, project. Uh, but for us, we, you know, it's, it's one of those, in addition to making this more competitive, uh, it fits with our stewardship, you know, vision about minimizing our impacts and constantly getting better and, and, and lowering emissions while producing products that, that people need. Um, and it's something, you know, obviously our neighbors too that we've consulted with, uh, you know, they, they think it's great. It's a good use of that property that we have. Um, it creates, you know, more taxable opportunities for, for the city versus just leaving that land, um, you know, either idle or, or, or for being farmed. So just a lot of kind of mutual benefit, uh, I think, across the board with this project. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Barm. Um, I wrote it out in the chat pretty much, but the, here it said that you, with income in, in combination with the combined heat and power system, it will provide 70% of Pine Bend's power. Oh, I'm not sure what the com combined heat and power system is, but uh, solar, I assume you're a 24 hour type operation, but the sun is there an average of 12 hours, and then many days are cloudy. So, um, you know, you'd probably be lucky to get 35% um, uh, um, of whatever your peak, uh, well, not even your peak, but a good whatever you really expected to get out of your panels of the time. So the only way to get a larger percent for your of your thing uh, to be used by solar would be to actually sell solar back to your utility when it is producing at a very peak time. Are you planning to do that? Yeah, so the way this will work for, for us, and, and you're right, um, in that 70% number is based on optimal conditions. So when the, the sun's shining you know, during the day, um, our, our CHP is, is very good. It's a combined heat and power. So it's a very, it uses natural gas and steam to generate electricity, including waste heat or steam that we have in surplus. So it's a really efficient way to, to you know, produce you know, electrical power. Uh, and it's obviously co-located with uh, you know where the demand actually is. So really great project. Yeah, and so solar to this, uh, and again, you're you're correct. It's under optimal conditions it would meet that um, that that threshold. Um, solar panels have gotten pretty good. Where you know when, when it's cloudy, they 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 do pretty good, They're just fine. And they do great in the winter as well. For us, um, economically, um, what's great about solar is. Um, you know, when the sun's out, um, that that's you know typically um, the most expensive time of day. You know, for our energy that we buy from from Excel, and so this displaces is really the least economic energy that we're getting. You know, during our, our demand. So obviously, at night it's different. Um, you know, we're still being supplied by, by Excel Energy. You know, 
we look a little bit into kind of uh, you know storage and, and battery. Uh, that doesn't quite make economic sense at, at this point uh, for us, uh, since again, it it's really matches up so well uh, on, on on the price of energy we pay during the day being so high that this just fits so well. And, and then we can you know figure out longer term perhaps some, some maybe storage options if uh, if it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Jake, do you do you guys uh, pay a lower rate uh, at night? I know, like people with electric cars, they keep telling XL keeps telling people, you know, charge in the off hours, and uh, you know, you get a lower rate. Does the refinery also have that happening? Yeah, it's it's definitely. Uh, I mean, they create incentives, right? Um, to um, to to you know power uh, or use power, um, you know, during off peak, if you will, times. And so, um, yeah, and like I said, for, for this, this works so great because uh, during peak demand during the day, energy is really expensive. And, and so this offsets some of that, uh, but then at night, um, you know, it's less expensive. Uh, so it's a better you know, alternative just to continue to, to, to buy, you know, power from, from Excel. Um, versus uh, figuring out maybe the battery thing at this point anyway. Uh, and uh, I know a question too was asked, I don't think I answered the rest of Mark's question about um, selling back to the grid, but every ounce of power we generate will we'll consume. Um, you know, there are situations where our refinery is never closed. <laughs> you know, now and then we, we go through these big maintenance events um, where certain units are, are done down for a period of time for, for maintenance, but the refinery runs continuously 24 seven year round uninterrupted. Um, so, you know, our power can vary a little bit in that respect, but I don't think there's a scenario we envision where, you know, there's ever gonna be surplus power uh, that, that we would, you know, have any ability or desire to, you know, sell back to, uh, to, to the grid. And doing so also would, um, I believe, make us an electric utility. So we'd be then subject to um, you know, PUC regulations as, a, as a, an electric utility. Um, and, and so that's, that's just a whole other kind of complication that would uh, likely um, get in the way of um, you know, the ability of, of selling power back to, uh, to the grid. I just, I just see a question from, uh, from Mr. Asher. And he was asking about wind power, which is what Jake and I talked about today. Can you want to share with people your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, so um, and and actually, uh, um, uh, believe it or not, I, I I was the original sponsor of, of this project in our in our company, and which is really neat. To, uh, you know, I'm in a public sector role, and I work closely with operations on our leadership team, and um, which which is great. But I tell you, I, I never envisioned. Um, you know, in, in the type of work that I do, um, you know, to be able to help advance a project like this, um, you know, spending upwards of, I think, $75 million or so uh, to do this project. And, and it just, it's, it's really rewarding to, to be able to, you know, help advance something like this, uh, work with our company, uh, you know, people understanding the value and, and now, now it's happening. And so that's really exciting. But uh, to answer your, your question, you know, specifically, um, you know, we looked a little bit at, at wind on the front end, uh, but um, as I showed you, I, uh, on, uh, with respect to the Pine Bend Bluffs area, we are part of a major migratory flyway. There are a lot of programs uh, that are aimed at habitat. And so we were a little concerned about potential uh, impacts there on solar. Uh, we thought, you know, lower profile, or, I'm sorry, wind, uh, lower profile um, uh, renewable energy like solar also, I, I think, fits a little bit better in that area of, of Rosemont. Um, you know, from a neighbor perspective, um, you know, I just, it's a little harder to see, right? And it's just a good use of property. Um, so we just thought ultimately, uh, especially from a, um, from, from a bird standpoint, um, might not be the best place to, to locate a, a lot of, a lot of wind. Uh, and then also, um, you know, we think this lower profile renewable energy, um, at least for us in this area is, is better. Okay. One other question I had was now when you get all these panels operational and that'll be fed into the plant, will like the control center for the solar be part of your, I, I took the tour there at, at your operation center or will that be a separate, you know, center set up for the solar or is most everything, you know, handled with AI nowadays? 
Yeah, there'll definitely be some AI in there, but um, it will be operated separately uh, from the refinery. Um, we'll, and it'll actually be managed by um, our EPC, uh, you know, DEPCOM. Uh, so they'll be, um, you know, kind of the operator, if you will, of, uh, of, of that asset on, on that side of the fence. So it'll all be fenced in uh, apart from the refinery, uh, but uh, I guess plugged in, if you will. Okay. Yeah, I, I spent some time checking out Depcon and and uh, man, they are one huge operation. They are all over the country putting it. I think they said they have like over five gigawatts that they've got out right now, just in the last couple of years. So, yeah, they are impressive, and it's been a, you know I don't think they've built a solar project in in the north. I know this is the first one they've done in in Minnesota. So, and and again, the first one they've ever done behind the meter. So it's an exciting opportunity for them. Um, you know, they're still uh, very new to, to Coke. Uh, like I said, a total coincidence that Coke uh, ultimately acquired this, this company that we were working with as, um, as our likely our potential you know, EPC. Uh, so we're learning a lot from them too, on um, you know, their business and how it works. And so it's been a really neat collaboration in, in that respect. And, and, you know, Coke has become, you know, kind of a microcosm of the global economy. And there's so many different businesses that do different things and we're able to collaborate and learn from each other. And this is just a really, really great example of that. That's great. Anyone else have any questions? I, we've hit the uh, magical hour, but we got a little bit more time if people have questions. Chris, you must have something you wanna know. We can't hear you. Still muted. Yeah, you're muted. Can you unmute? Oh, okay. <laughs> Chris always has a lot of good questions on these things too. So any, anyone else uh, have questions? Well, if not, I, I just want to really, really thank Jake for spending the time and sharing the information. Uh, I enjoyed learning more about the uh, refinery side of things too. That was very interesting about all the all the different things that go, you know, when you think about it, oh yeah, that's just putting out uh, gasoline and stuff, but it's much more than that. So that was I think, really uh, interesting. And by the way, we, we do uh, public tours. Um, we try to do them on a quarterly basis. You, you can go to our website uh, and, and sign up if you're ever interested uh, in doing that, or you can just reach out to me, um, you know, directly. Uh, but you know, our uh, head of operations there is just so welcoming and encouraging um, to to have people come through and learn about you know what we do and how we do it. Uh, we know it can be kind of a mystifying looking place from from afar and uh, there's a lot going on and it's complex uh, but but uh, we're, we're proud of the work we do and um, you know the, you know the products that we make um, you know are still very much needed and will be needed for for some time to come so we want to you know do the best job we can possibly do uh, in, in making those those products in the most responsible way possible so we're happy to share. Um, and by the way, that website, there's two websites. There's our corporate website, which is where our stewardship report um, I mentioned earlier is it was just published today. And then there's one that's specific to Minnesota. It's the um, FHR or Flint Hills Resources Pine Bend Refinery uh, uh, website. Um, so pinebendrefinery.com. Um, there again, you can find out more specific information about Minnesota and our operations. And uh, like I said, sign up for tours and uh, we have more information on our community engagement and all the things that we do and all the great company or organizations we partner with in, in, in Minnesota. Yeah, that was quite a list you guys have there. Uh, I, I just want to share with people that uh, next month, our plan is to have Minnesota Energy Excellence uh, organization talking about what they're doing for training with uh, solar and other things here in the state of Minnesota. And uh, so with that, uh, we'll say good night and thank you again, Jake. We really appreciate it. Great presentation. And uh, again, thank you everyone. And uh, for MRES people, we'll be gathering at the, uh, at the board meeting here in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Right.
Thanks, Ellie. Yep.